Okay, so I, I think it's six o'clock here, uh, UK time. Uh, uh, many of us are in Scotland, in the UK, but we have students all over the world. So I, I'm sure they're really interested in hearing your viewpoints on cryptography, ethics, and obviously with the Ukraine situation at the current time, it's really such an important uh, uh, topic. So I think I'll, I'll start off uh, with with the ethics side. So you've you've been critical uh, to a certain extent about the the teaching of ethics within technology. So how do you think academics could improve their uh, coverage of ethics in their topic areas? It's a good question. And first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm sorry I can't be in Scotland personally. I was telling Bill, uh, d as we were uh, talking beforehand, that I had the uh, privilege of being in Scotland in the summer of 2019, the last summer that one could actually be there. And be and, and I came to Edinburgh. Uh, we are staying midway between Glasgow and uh, Edinburgh for a week. It was a beautiful time and the people were wonderful. So coming back to your question, uh, I think the problem with teaching ethics is we tend to lecture. We tend to say, here's how to be more ethical. When I gave my talk uh, in Lindau uh, at the annual meeting of Nobel laureates, I told them when I started off that I was tempted to subtitle it, how I screwed up and how you can avoid doing the same, because that's something people can relate to. They can believe you when you say that you made, or in this case, I made a decision I realized later unethically. I, at the time I thought I was making it ethically. So that was the first lesson in fact that I had in that talk was how easy it is to fool ourselves. And I said, or to make it more personally, more personal, how, easy, how easily I fooled myself and then how I came to realize this. So I think that's the problem. Uh, uh, I mean, basically as soon as someone realizes they're unethical they'll change it. And so uh, we have to see the sides of ourselves, the shadow sides, the sides that we cannot accept that are so socially abhorrent to us that we can't admit at a conscious level that they exist. How do we do that? And that's part of the problem. And we need to do that both personally and internationally, which gets to situations like Ukraine. And obviously you were involved in the first crypto war, uh, late 1970s. And did you know how dangerous this technology, this new method that you had actually created uh, was, and at the time did you feel that that tension of, of law enforcement, government agencies against citizen rights? Good question. Um, so it started off when the, this started with the data encryption standard, whose which the key size was not adequate. And uh, when we first, when Whit and I first observed this, we thought it was a, a, a bug that the government would fix. And uh, so we wrote to them naively, assuming they would fix it because it was cheap and easy to fix. Uh, only after about six months did we realize that we had a political problem, not a technical problem, on our hands. And I remember my mother, who was still alive in those days, uh, called me and said, what are you doing? I mean, because this made front page news. I was fighting NSA. And I was also fighting their foreign equivalents implicitly, including the, the Soviet uh, uh, spy agencies. And so uh, I don't know the exact situation. Uh, um, some people told me that uh, my life was, my, was in danger. Uh, other people told me uh, that was ridiculous. And I don't know where the truth is between the two. Uh, but it wasn't something that I did to be courageous. I mean, I just initially started thinking it was a bug. It was like a friend of ours who was a uh, captain in the Marines when he was in the uh, flown over. He, he, he did two tours in Iraq and he wrote to me saying, everybody says what a hero I am. He said, I just joined ROTC so I didn't have to pay for college. There was no war at the time. And the same thing kind of happened to me. It was a uh, uh, kind of an accidental uh, courage. But th that's the interesting thing is how much courage people uh, can show uh, when they find themselves in this situation. We have much more than we think. Yeah. Okay. And you've been involved in quite a few startup companies and uh, obviously it's really important for us to build new companies of scale for the future because the, the future could be all full of Googles and Microsofts and very much focused on the West Coast of the US and it really doesn't give the opportunity for innovation to, to thrive. So if you were to start again, and you were to give some advice to startups and spin out teams, what advice would you give them? 
Well, I don't know that I'm qualified to do that, but I will tell you a story. Uh, and Dan Bona, who you probably know, the uh, professor here at Stanford, has given me permission to name him in this. Uh, it must have been around 2000 when uh, Google, the Google search engine had first come out. And of course they were Stanford students in, in computer science. And so Dan and I were some of the, two of the very early people using the Google search engine. And we said to one another, um, you know, it's a great search engine, but how are they ever gonna make money from free search? Well, what we should have done is ask the question, how can they make money from free search rather than asking it as a question, but meaning it as a statement. And that's something we need to do much more of. And so uh, uh, I don't have exactly have an answer to your question, but I hope that helps in some ways. And by the way, no one can expect to bat a thousand, uh, or I don't know what the equivalent would be in Britain. Uh, that we're, no, nobody can hit every pitch, basically. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, we miss Google. Um, uh, and you can't really criticize people. One of the things about Silicon Valley that's so important and needs to be seen in other parts of the world is the importance of failure. If you're not failing uh, some of the time, you're not taking enough risk. And the only way to hit what I call a full home run is to swing at a lot of wild pitches. And so uh, public key cryptography is a good example of a full home run. Uh, all my colleagues, and I don't think that's an exaggeration to say all, uh, certainly almost all, initially told me that I was foolish to work in, public, in, in cryptography before we had the, these results. And they had two very good reasons, uh, uh, which were almost uni universal. The first is, uh, how can you hope to discover something that NSA, the American National Security Agency, doesn't already know because they have this huge budget, they've got decades head start. And the second uh, argument was, if you do anything good, they, meaning NSA, will classify it. And both arguments had validity. Both arguments came to haunt us eventually. And yet winning the Turing Award and all the other major awards we've won for doing this work says how wise it was to do something that appeared so foolish. And at the, I mentioned the talk I was honored to give, and in fact, uh, hopefully the students, uh, the attendees at this seminar have, have watched that uh, 30 minute talk um, to the Nobel laureates in um, uh, Lindau, Germany in 2019. Yeah, 2019. And I had the opportunity to ask five of the Nobel laureates in attendance, and these were mostly physicists and chemists. I asked them about the work that won you your Nobel prize was it initially encouraged as great idea, run with it? Or was it derided as foolish and it will never go anywhere? Four of the five foolish never go anywhere. So don't be afraid to try something foolish. In fact, one of them, Danny Sheckman, who won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for quasi crystals, told me that no less an authority than um, Linus Pauling, who won the Nobel Prize twice, once in chemistry, once uh, for peace, to, uh, called it quasi science. It would seem so ridiculous. So the best ideas often seem crazy a priori. Yeah. Okay. And then for innovation, do, do you see, I, I appreciate your work in cryptography recently hasn't, hasn't involved and has been as much involved in research, but do you see any evolving areas on the horizon that you would advise people to get into? No, uh, uh, first of all, uh, even if I were, if I, I'm not actively involved in research in cryptography these days, I have to call my friends when I need uh, input on something. Uh, but even if I were, whatever, whatever sounds reasonable probably isn't. It's the crazy ideas that will make it. And I'm too established now, I'm too old. Uh, when I was 30 years old, 29 years old, uh, uh, I had the, um, I, I wasn't yet locked in. And a good example is, um, Quantum, the quantum theory of light. Max Planck in 1900 really discovered the quantum uh, nature of light uh, when he explained black body radiation. And he had won, already won the Nobel, I think he'd already won the Nobel Prize. He certainly didn't win it for that, but he discounted it as a purely theoretical construct. Whereas Einstein five years later in, in, in having, in trying to explain, explaining the photoelectric effect treated it as, um, uh, as fact. Whereas, and part of the problem, so the, each of them, oh, so one of my key mentors in this area, Harry Rathbun, and I think I quote this in the uh, Lindau talk, defined the scientific spirit as a zealous search for the truth with a ruthless disregard for commonly held beliefs when contradicted by observations. And Harry, who had a, a, an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering, and by the way, he was born in the 1890s, he died in the 1980s. Uh, Harry 
said, we've, we've made great strides applying this to science, but it needs to be applied to interpersonal relations and international relations. But here's a good example where both um, Planck and Einstein had a zealous search for the truth, but Planck was too old, too, too established. Einstein was young and, 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 and the maverick. Uh, the, Einstein had the ruthless disregard for commonly held beliefs when contradicted by observations that Planck did not. And I'm afraid that today at 76 years old and as well established as I am, I would be more like Planck than Einstein. So don't listen to me. Yeah. And, and we're probably into the third era of crypto wars and now it's end-to-end -end encryption, which is the, is the enemy. Uh, where do you think this will end up? Do you think governments and law enforcement will be able to get back doors into crypto or is it more like the ghost in the machine where they're in the clouds? Apple tried with their, their scanning software on the devices and mm -hmm. obviously there was great push back on that. Uh, so where do you think we'll, we'll, we'll end up with this war? Yeah, so first of all, this is actually, well, it's, it is the third crypto war. In many ways, it's the second crypto war repeated. Uh, and the difference this, because the first crypto war was over freedom to publish DES key size. And that was in the late 70s, early 80s. And that I was intimately involved in. And then the second crypto war was in the mid 90s, clipper chip, uh, key escrow, uh, and the third one, which is uh, basically uh, facilitate uh, exceptional access is what I think they're calling it now. It's interesting to see that both NSA and the FBI in the second crypto war were arguing for a backdoor, as you call it. Although I would say it's a front door because everybody knows it's there. A backdoor is one that I tend to think of as hidden. Uh, and yet it is called a backdoor, which I think is a mistake. Um, but um, it's interesting that in this third crypto war, which is really crypto war 2.1 in many ways, uh, the, uh, several former directors of NSA have said the FBI is wrong to seek this exceptional access. And uh, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. I think the problem is uh, that you cannot protect the good guys, meaning you and me and, and, and everybody watching this, uh, uh, from the bad guys who are trying to look at their files without also protecting some bad guys, you know, like terrorists from the good guys, the uh, uh, intelligence agencies working to bring them in. An analogy that I've used is ima imagine that um, uh, automobiles had been developed in the classified literature, the classified world, and the only people that had them were the police and uh, the good military, whoever that is. I mean, you can argue about who's good and who's bad. Uh, and suddenly uh, some guys, Diffie and Hellman invented the, the car in the open literature, and there was all this outcry. Wait a minute, the criminals are going to get away. The you know uh, what'll happen? And that's true, but it's overlooking all the benefits that the uh, uh, transportation uh, would provide to the world as a whole. And so we need to balance those. Yeah, and you worked with Ralph Merkel, and one of my favorite patents ever. I, I love I love classic patents, <laughs> and when you look back over them. You can see Ralph Merkel's patent. I think it was two pages outlining the uh, uh, the Merkel tree. And when I see blockchain, I see the Merkel tree. And it's a shame we oh. don't talk about the Merkel tree rather than blockchain. It's kind of lost the whole reasoning behind it. And we see hash-based signatures too. It's probably the post-quantum method that, that might be the most robust for security. But you worked alongside uh, this genius. So oh. did you see, I mean, his ideas were almost like a couple of years before ev everyone else. And and he was so open with them. What was your feeling about Ralph Merkel at the time? Sure. Did he just explode ideas? And uh, <laughs> Ralph, Ralph explodes. Uh, he came into my office maybe 30 years ago. He's a big man. And he yeah. comes in like this and he, he comes in, he's kind of all, all present. He comes in, he plops down on a chair and he says, Marty, I'm building a human brain. Now, I don't think he has, but uh, maybe, maybe he has. He's working in nanotechnology and things like that. And Ralph is one of the great unsung heroes of uh, cryptography. There are several others. Uh, but um, he developed the idea of not signatures, but the um, um, public key exchange at Berkeley as an undergraduate student in his senior year and then in his master's year. And it's wonderful. Uh, he took a course, CS244 at Berkeley uh, in the fall of 74. And he, we have uh, 
and he scanned, and I think I have it in places, um, his course proposal, because he had to do a course project. And what the first pro proposed project was to develop the privacy side of public key cryptography, secure communication over insecure channels without prearrangement. The other uh, one, I forget what it was, but it was nowhere near as interesting. And we have the professor wrote in blue ink on the first page, idea number two looks better than idea number one, perhaps because your description is so muddled. And in the professor's defense, uh, Ralph did, had not really spelled it out. Plus, it flew in the face of conventional wisdom. There was not the ruthless disregard for commonly held beliefs when contradicted by a proposal in this case. And uh, while Ralph's paper appeared a year or two after ours, um, he actually submitted it before, and we would have merged them if we'd been together uh, in the same institution, but he'd already put his in, we'd already put ours in. And uh, so R Ralph is one of the great unsung heroes, no question. And Merkle trees, as you point out, are used all over the place. Uh, he, he, he is, uh, he was and is a brilliant researcher and deserves a lot more credit. Yeah, because I think one of his papers proposing public key encryption was, was rejected. I oh, think it was by the, by yeah, the so I'll, 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 I'll go through. So Ralph submitted his paper to the CACM, the communications uh, of the ACM, yeah. uh, and before, we sub before our, our paper was published, we didn't know of each other's work. And uh, the editor rejected it. And I love this. Uh, what she said was um, something like, um, this appears not to be in the main, oh, she had a, she had a reviewer who was an expert in cryptography who said, uh, this paper is not in the mainstream of cryptographic thought. <laughs> of course, it was new, it was seminal. And she also wrote, it bothers me that you have no references. Is this, has no one thought of anything like this before? The answer is no. Now, in her defense, Ralph should have had some references, even if though it was a totally new idea. And he didn't know how to write a paper in those days. I mean, he was an undergraduate, and a master's student, and everybody, no one at Berkeley appreciated him. I basically kidnapped him and brought him to Stanford to do his PhD research. I, uh, Whit Diffie has called me a great talent scout. And uh, while I think I have some other uh, 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 other uh, areas as well, I am very good at recognizing talent. Wit and Ralph, and uh, uh, there have been some others, but those are the ones right now uh, were overlooked and I saw something in them. And so, yes, I've been uh, working with Ralph was a privilege and an honor. Yeah, I think that's, that's the core privilege of working in a university is that uh, really you can spot potential people who have ideas and then support them in some way and allow them to fly uh, without holding on to their IP and so on. So I think obviously you've, you've been amazing with that. If oh, you... another one was Tahir, Tahir El Gamal. Oh, uh, oh El Gamal. It's all, it's all had, coming back, yeah. Yeah, I just had lunch with him uh, about wow. 10 days ago. Uh, oh, wow. He, he, he just been, I nominated him, well, actually, I, I, well, okay, I guess it's okay to say, I nominated him for uh, uh, election to the National Academy of Engineering, and he was, uh, he was uh, admitted, and so we had a lunch to celebrate, and we could eat outside, fortunately, and I remember Tyre coming to me uh, in his graduate work with this idea uh, for the, basically what became the first digital signature standard uh, with the Schnorr variation uh, on Tiger's work. And um, uh, he said, should I patent this? And the advice I gave him is I said, it's up to you, but we've tried, we have patent applications, maybe patents issued already for, uh, pub, you know, for the basic work in public key cryptography, but we haven't made any money off them. And it's been a lot of work, uh, it's up to you. He did not patent it. And I sometimes wondered if I had made a mistake. But he said, no, uh, because it was an unpatented, people did a lot of work on El Gamal signatures. And when he became chief scientist at Netscape, when he was talking to Jim Clark for that position, Jim Clark knew who he was because of this. So he, feel, uh, he feels it was a great thing. So uh, we'll never know for sure, but that was another, another talent scout, uh, Tyre El Gamal, I mean, brilliant man. Father, the father of TLS, I think. Yes, so that, <laughs> that, that TLS 1.3, we've hardly even let it grow up. It's hardly even yeah, evolved. Uh, so. SSL3, we've gone beyond that, but it lasted about 20 years. And he and Paul Kotcher uh, won the Mar uh, Marconi Prize. Uh, again, um, I, I, I won't go into details on that, for their work on uh, SSL3, which was really a whole new variation. It's not just a, a slight improvement over SSL2. Yeah, because uh, it was really the way that it was 
uh, uh, crippled, caused us so many problems, beast and logjam and all these vulnerabilities were caused because of the export uh, embargo around uh, SSL because the keys oh. were, were so yeah. short. Oh, and Paul Koch is another example of being a good talent yeah. scout. In his sophomore, Paul, so Paul Kotcher uh, founded Cryptography Research Inc. Sold it for three hundred and fifty million dollars two years, wow. uh, ten years ago. And the Spectre um, uh, weakness in microprocessors was speculative execution. Paul came up with that. Someone else came up, up with it independently about the same time. But uh, Paul really is, is is again a brilliant man. Uh, in his sophomore year at Stanford, uh, he sent me an email saying, "This is nineteen ninety three, probably." Uh, I'd like to talk to you about cryptography. He was majoring in biology. He's a sophomore. I figure maybe he wants to know how to solve newspaper cryptograms. But a few minutes into the conversation, it was clear that he knew more about cryptography than most people with PhDs or even professors in the area. And people often say he was my student, but Paul's really almost primarily self-taught. Uh, and so that was another example. And he st still only has a bachelor's degree in biology. He was going to become a veterinarian. But I brought him in to uh, a seminar that I had, uh, and he became the prime contributor. And I started throwing consulting his way that I didn't have time for. And that became, he said, the venture capital for uh, CRI Cryptography Research, Inc. Yeah, that's amazing. And the university here, uh, the, the castle, the tower, is John Napier's tower. And obviously, with discrete logs, it was your method. And El, El Gamo was also a discrete logs method. And it's, it's strange the way that the El Gamo method is coming back again. And you talked about Peter Snorr there. I mean, he did he did patent. And a lot of the homomorphic encryption methods, a lot of the signing, distributed signing, we've, we have this ECDSA with Bitcoin and Ethereum, and it's not scaling that well. So the method that Satoshi Nakamoto selected really doesn't scale in a distributed world. But Peter Snor's method and El Gamo method works much better because you can use additions to aggregate uh, keys. Mm. And, and almost like Peter's work wasn't exploited for all those years. So do you think it was maybe, a, is it a mistake to, to patent some of these methods so that they're not adopted? Well, let's see, two things. Uh, three, uh, first of all, uh, whatever happens is with uh, some people say I'm from California when I say whatever happens was fated to happen. I mean, uh, my wife had somebody tell her that many years ago, but I won't go into details. But I want to come back to Napier because that's very important and discrete logarithms. Another um, key um, uh, unsung hero of cryptography is John Gill. John, John did his yeah. PhD in mathematics with Manuel Blum, who is usually in, C oh. who was in the CS department at Berkeley. And it must have been about 19, so I came on the faculty here in 71, John in 72. So I always think of him as the new kid, even though he's far from the new kid. And he's, he's the, uh, one, of the first black under, uh, under, one of the first black graduates of Georgia Tech, uh, uh, also African-American. Uh, I went to John because I was looking for one-way functions, which are the simplest cryptographic entity. We didn't even have public key cryptography at the time. And I said, John, you're a mathematician. I'm not. Uh, what, what functions can you think of that are easy to compute but hard to invert? And he first brought up, mentioned fa uh, factoring, which we'd already looked at, but we, we did not yet have public key cryptography. So we walked all around RSA, but missed it, which means they deserve all the more credit. But then he said, what about indices? And I said, what's an index? Well, it's what we call a discrete logarithm today, but mathematicians call them indices. And that became... So John, uh, I really owe John a, a, a huge uh, debt of gratitude for the Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange, as it's often called these days, because that's based, I was trying to use indices or discrete logarithms and uh, working at this very desk where I'm talking now, uh, one, late one night in, I think it was um, probably May of 1976, uh, I, I, I put things together and suddenly it came out. Um, but the other thing, coming back to regular logarithms in Napier, um, when I was in junior high school, I, I'd been fantastic at math, but in junior high school, there was a kid, Henry Laufer, who was head and shoulders above me in mathematics. And this was just a neighborhood school. There was something in the drinking water, I think. Uh, uh, and um, uh, Henry did a, um, uh, he, by the way, uh, got a 
he got through City College with his undergraduate degree in two years in mathematics, and then did a PhD at I think Princeton in another probably two years, and was on the faculty at Stony Brook uh, with uh, Jim Simons, who you may have heard of. And um, um, uh, I remember meeting Henry about 30 years ago, and he said, uh, the hedge fund that Jim Simons had started, which is Renaissance Technologies, the most successful hedge fund ever, uh, Henry's worth $4 billion, according to um, Wikipedia. I don't know if it's true, but uh, Henry said, the hedge fund's gotten so big, I either have to give up the hedge fund or I have to give up my tenured professorship. He gave up his tenured professorship and he's now worth presumably $4 billion. Uh, but that was, oh, Henry's science fair project in uh, seventh or eighth grade was on, on a slide rule, logarithms. And um, so uh, brilliant. Uh, thing. I mean, such, again, a, a, a seminal revolutionary approach where you could turn multiplication into addition and exponentiation uh, became so much easier. So we owe so much to Napier, uh, the namesake yeah. of the university. Oh, yeah. And we obviously have Maxwell here, uh, who, who probably is one of the greatest scientists. Oh, James Clark Maxwell was it was there too? Yeah, James Clark Maxwell. Uh, yeah, I knew he was Scottish. I didn't know that. He, Aberdeen. He, Edinburgh, and then I think he ended up in Cambridge. I think it was, but uh, he was certainly a, a Scot. And and his, I, I did my PhD on on his equations, and and really it was quite inspirational the work that he did. So actually, this comes back to the um, Planck and Einstein. Um, before Maxwell, there had been a debate whether light was a particle or a wave, and as many people of the attendees probably know. Uh, Newton was in the particle camp, and then James Clerk Maxwell in the 1870s came up with his famous equations that showed that light clearly behaves like a wave. And so when Planck, that's one reason why in 1900 when Planck explained black body radiation and he had to assume that light was emitted in, as particles, he saw it as purely theoretical construct. It was going back to the dark ages, to the time of Newton. And it took Einstein to say, no, light can behave as a particle and a wave. Which, by the way, is something my wife Dorothy says. We're often arguing, and not, we don't argue anymore. We haven't had a fight in almost 20 years, which is amazing. Uh, and by the way, we have a book about that whose subtitle is uh, Creating True Love at Home and Peace on the Planet that a former Secretary of Defense said should be read by couples seeking peace at home as well as by diplomats seeking peace in the world. And you don't even have to buy the book. You can download a free PDF from my website or uh, Bill can probably uh, get it for you get you the link. But um, Dorothy calls it the big Anne. When we used to say, is it this or is it that? And the two seem mutually exclusive. It often turns out that it's some of each. That's interesting. And we had uh, Len Edelman uh, last year, and it's really interesting, the story of RSA. And, and you obviously had Ralph Merkel creating knapsack that Shamir went ahead and broke. And I think Shamir and Edelman were really core in that team because Rivest would come up with these great ideas and they would knock them down. So they were more like the crypto analysts. Well, I think, I think was... I, I'd have to check, but I think it was Len who was the analyst. I think uh, yeah. Adi tended to work with Ron on coming up with ideas and then Len would knock them all down. And the story, as I remember it, is when Ron proposed that all three of them put their names on the paper, Len said, I, I don't really belong there. But he does. I mean, no question. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, do you think teams work better together, or is it? Do you think it's better to have independent people, independent big science? End. It's the big end. Uh, the big end. Yeah. Clearly, I was working at my desk alone one night that I came up with uh, alpha well, uh, alpha to the x one x two, or now as most people call it, Diffie Hellman key exchange. So I did that on my own, but I couldn't have done it without Wit, who first postulated the concept of public key cryptography, including signatures. Um, I couldn't have done it without John Gill. And so it's you need to have a community uh, within which you work, but then you also need time on your own. So I think it's both. Yeah. And obviously you've been a, you've been a long-term advocate of uh, uh, against nuclear weapons and, and we've all faced this in the last week. One week, it's been one week, it just seems such a trauma. And I, I wonder if you've had time to really reflect on where we are, where nuclear weapons fit 
into this new environment that 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 we're in, uh, because obviously they could have such a devastating effect locally and and across the world. So, what's your feelings just now and where we are? Well, let's see. First of all, my I have to say, my heart goes out to the people of Ukraine, and my heart goes out to the poor Russian conscripts that have been put in harm's way. I mean. Uh, 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 but the, what's happening in Ukraine is, is, is a crime against humanity, no question. Of course, the United States has perpetrated some crimes against humanity that we tend to overlook, but for right now, we have to focus on uh, what's happening there. Uh, the first thing I wanna say is you said that um, I work against nuclear wow. weapons, and I can see how it seems that way. Many people say that, but I never try not to work against anything. I try to work for something. Uh, the way it's all been put by some people, a group I worked with in the 80s that no longer exists, that got me started in this area. They said, we need to not slay the dinosaur, we need to build the gazelle. Uh, and so the thing that motivates me to work on this is not so much the threat of nuclear weapons as the vision of the kind of world we would need to build to get rid of the nuclear threat. Because the nuclear threat does not come from nuclear weapons, it comes from bad foreign policy. Uh, that if you trace it down, nuclear, nuclear war is likely to start with a conventional war, which is likely to start with a, a conflict which is, comes from foreign policy where we have an overly simplified view. And, this, and here's where Ukraine comes into it. Whenever you hear a narrative where one side is all good and the other side is all bad, then it's almost surely an overly simplified narrative. And that's the narrative we're getting right now. There's plenty of evidence why Russia is bad, why Putin is bad, and he's uh, behaving irrationally. Uh, but this does not mean that everything that he's saying is irrational. And what we need to do is to try to figure out what is at the core of this that we might be able to deal with so that we can reduce and eventually eliminate the human suffering in Ukraine. But one thing that gives me hope in a, in a, a different area from usual is the number of Russians who have been protesting the war at great risk to themselves. And just yesterday, I saw an article in um, uh, online, it's Sky Today or Sky, something like that. An old friend of mine, Andrei Kortunov, um, who worked with me on a book called uh, Breakthrough Emerging New Thinking in the 80s, which is also available online uh, free of charge as a PDF. This came out in 1987 at the, uh, in the period of rapidly changing Soviet Western, Soviet American uh, relations. Uh, Andre was one of the contributors to that book. It's an, a, a volume of essays that I co-edited with uh, Anatoly Gromyko, the son of Andre Gromyko. And um, Kortunov is, is, is quoted as saying he was shocked by, the, by, by, by Putin's actions and by the war. And so there are people even within the Kremlin inner circle, maybe not the greatest inner circle, but uh, that, that, that uh, see, see danger here. And this is the, one of the few things that could actually bring Putin down. So Putin needs to recognize, and I think he, I hope he will be seeking an exit. We need to give him a face-saving way of doing that because anything other than a face-saving way will just prolong the conflict and the number of people uh, who are hurt and killed. Yeah, and, and, and it's worrying that we see some of the media being shut down in, in Russia and that suppression, it's almost like going back to the 60s again and, and, and earlier. Uh, so do, do you think that the, the West can try to, to improve the, the dissemination of information or, or do you think it's really up to the Russians to make their own minds up? Well, it's up to the Russians. We, we, we can't, con I mean, the only person I have control over is me. As long as in my marriage, when I, when I used to try to deal with my, change my wife, nothing worked. <laughs> my life just got worse and worse. It's when I started to change myself and she committed to change herself that things got better. But the other thing I'd say is that while there is uh, control of the media in Russia, no question about it, and it's getting worse. I mean, they're in wartime now. Uh, it's not like the 1960s. In the 1960s, you would not have had uh, the protests that you have. You would not have had Andrei Kortunov speaking out the way he, he, he has. And we need to look, and while it's not as egregious in the West, we need to look at how we have uh, limitations on what we read. For example, um, in 2014, when the revolution took place in Ukraine, the Russians saw it as a coup. I won't go into why they saw it that way, but they have some valid reasons behind that. Uh, and um, the, the 
I have on my, uh, I have a recording of the Estonian foreign minister, so no friend of Russia's, who was in Kiev in a few days after the massacre that went to Yanukovych fleeing. And he concludes, he's talking in English, fortunately, it was intercepted by the Russian intelligence service and put online. And it was confirmed by his office, by the way. They didn't confirm and say, yes, he said that. They said, you shouldn't pay any attention to it because he was merely uh, uh, relaying a rumor. But if you listen to it, he was not merely, I don't think he was merely relaying a rumor. Uh, he, his conclusion is the evidence is stronger and stronger that behind the snipers, it was not Yanukovych's people, but elements from the new coalition, that is the, the protesters, like right sector and, um, uh, well, the Azov Battalion didn't exist, it was probably the right sector. Uh, we don't know that that's true, but there should have been an investigation. And the only investigations I've seen uh, that took place were by BBC and ARD, uh, ARD TV, the uh, German equivalent, I think, or semi-equivalent. And both of them reached the, roughly the same conclusion. Uh, and it's incontrovertible that the Ukrainian uh, general prosecutor bungled the investigation because some of the people who were injured and some of the families of, of those killed tried suing and they could not get the evidence because the, the, from the uh, general prosecutor. Okay. I've got a question here. Uh, Devi, would you like to ask Marty? Uh, thank you, Dr. Hillman, uh, for taking this opportunity you know, and talking to us. Uh, we are much honored. Uh, I've got two questions for you. Uh, one is for young researchers. You know, like my son is 26, he's doing his PhD. I'm a 53 year old man doing my second master's. You know, when they submit, you gave the example of Ralph uh, Mark earlier on, uh, you know, like on getting rejections on some of his papers. When the young researchers get their papers rejected in any conference or any seminar, they kind of get highly disappointed. What would be your advice to them, you know, like when they come across, you know, like these kind of failures? That's my first question, so. Okay, uh, well, well, let me answer that and then we'll go to your second one, because I'm, I'm, I'm yes. 76, my memory's <laughs> not that good. Um, so uh, when I was talking about Ralph Merkel's paper being rejected uh, once, uh, and I talked somewhat to this, one of the people said, yeah, I had a paper a year ago that was rejected from a conference, and this year it won the best paper award, the same paper. So. There are problems, uh, and yet it's important to look at it and see if maybe there is something there, uh, because we, we have blinders on. And so like when my wife used to say things that sounded crazy to me, I used to treat her like she was crazy, which drove her crazy, which convinced me I was right, there was a dangerous feedback loop. And so it's important to open up and, and to look and see if maybe there's something there. Uh, but my advice would be not to get discouraged. You have, remember, you have to, where I put it is to fit, to hit a full home run, you have to swing at a lot of wild pitches. So I, who but a fool would be excited by idea number 20, which a priori looks no better than ideas one through 19, each of which flop, flopped. And yet, if you don't get excited by idea number 20, say, oh, this just looks like what I've worked on before, you have no chance of success. And so uh, to maintain that foolish uh, enthusiasm, again, I. Uh, I'm Jewish, so I can quote the Gospels. You must be as a small child to enter the kingdom of God. You must be as a small child to win the Turing Award. You've got to have this foolish enthusiasm. What's your second question, Debbie? The second question is uh, regarding the current uh, situation. Uh, in your Linda uh, address, you had uh, showed, displayed an illustration where you had two uh, cables going, one into the White House and one into the Kremlin. And uh, you also, uh, you know, like in your second paper about rethinking national security, you spoke about uh, the tinfoil uh, effect, you know, like it could protect you from rain, but what happens if there is a thunderstorm? Do you think the current uh, events happening now is, you know, like that uh, cable uh, leading to Kremlin, uh, it's in a very precarious position? And is it that thunderstorm moment for the pinfoil? Yes, I've, I've got the question. So first of all, uh, in rethinking national security, I list a dozen assumptions that masquerade as self-evident truths that need to be looked at. Because if you have even one false assumption in a logical framework, you build a house of cards. And one of the questions that I raise is, does our, does our nuclear arsenal provide an umbrella? The impression is that it, that it protects 
And when I was teaching a course at Stanford about 10 years ago, a student from Britain, Katie Farron, uh, we've been talking about, she said, maybe the nuclear umbrella is made of tin foil and it works well in a rain shower, but not in a thunderstorm where it can turn deadly. And I think she's right. And I think that's the case here. My estimate is that the uh, probability of a nuclear war, a major nuclear war that would destroy civilization is on the order of 1% per year. And I have a paper that explains where that comes from. And Bill Perry, a former American Secretary of Defense has told me he agrees with that estimate. He has a PhD in mathematics, so he understands numbers. And he's told me I can quote him on that. Uh, now that 1% a year is averaged over roughly 10 years looking into the future, that is you know, 10% uh, per decade. But if you look in the past or you look at the current time, there can be local spikes. And the Cuban Missile Crisis was obviously a huge impulse that occurred in October, November, 1962. And we're in a, a current impulse as well. I would currently say, and this is more of a guess than my 1% a year estimate, uh, that it's 1% a month, roughly an order of magnitude larger with Ukraine. Uh, for example, uh, the French finance minister said that we have, we're, we're engaged in all out economic war with Russia designed to, I think, topple Putin. And Medvedev, who served as president of Russia, uh, said, you better watch it. Economic war, all out economic war can morph too easily into a hot war. And I would add into a nuclear war, therefore. So yes, we're in a very dangerous time. Three years gap between one major incident to another major incident. So 1945, and we're nearly like 75 years now. You know, like that estimate of 83 years of any major incident. You think well, well, actually, let me, let me take that. If you look at minor incidents, like the Ukrainian, I say minor, I mean, they're pretty serious, but they're not like Cuba 1962. Uh, we have the Georgian War in 2008. We have the Ukrainian Revolution in 2014. Those occurred six years apart. And there were a bunch of others. Syria was in there. Um, uh, but those occur about every five or 10 years. Uh, if you go an order of magnitude smaller than my estimate of 1% a year, that would be one chance in 1,000 per year. We'd have to expect our current approach to work for 1,000 years if nothing changed. And that's important, if nothing changed. But then we'd expect roughly 200 crises, 100 to 200 crises comparable to Ukraine 2014, which has now morphed into Ukraine 2022, where the risk is somewhere between what it was in 2014 and what it was in 1962. To think we could survive that many crises is just, uh, uh, seems wildly optimistic. Okay, let's go on, should we go on to another question maybe? But uh, thank, thank you, you for Debbie. Thanks. Okay. Sana? I th thank you, thank you, Dr. Hellman, for this opportunity, and also I would like to thank Dr. Bill here uh, for providing this opportunity. Uh, actually, my question is uh, more related to the cryptography, but I want to know your opinion uh, about the crypt cryptography in terms of the machine learning and artificial intelligence, as we have heard uh, different opinions from different, um, I mean, uh, I would like to quote here Stephen Hawking as well, as he mentioned that it can be either the best or the worst uh, of the, we can say the development of the humans. So generally, what do you think about AI? And then if you can uh, bring uh, the, I mean, the, the, this- I, I, uh, I've, got the, I've, got the, I've got the question and I, I, I have an answer which I think answers it. Yeah. On the surface, nuclear weapons seem to be a problem. AI and autonomous uh, lethal weapons seem to be the, a problem, and they are a problem. Uh, climate change seems to be a problem, and it is. But if you really look, uh, underlying all of these problems, there is a deeper source problem, which is the chasm between our godlike physical power on the one hand that technology has given us, including in cryptography, uh, although maybe, uh, yeah, cyber. Cyber warfare, where you can cripple society, uh, civilization, plant bombs in the uh, um, uh, electrical grid, things like that. Yeah. So the underlying problem is not uh, cryptography or nuclear weapons or climate change or any of these other things or genetic engineering. It's really the chasm between our godlike physical power that technology has given us and where is our maturity level as a species. Sometimes we're in the terrible twos where we throw tantrums. At best, as a species, we are irresponsible adolescents with quarter to quarter, four year to four year in the American political system, you know, where we have presidential elections every four years or every two years for Congress. Uh, Short-term thinking, 
we need to be thinking longer term. We can't say it, it's like the um, the man in the TNT vest that Deviat was mentioning. Uh, um, I, I, just because the the Earth's explosive vest has not yet gone off, it doesn't mean it never will. And yet many people say it works. Well, if we could say it hadn't worked, we wouldn't be here to say it. And so we need to start taking a long-term perspective. And that, if we solve that problem with climate change, if we solve that problem with nuclear weapons, if we solve that problem with uh, cyber attacks, I hope that we can then extend it to those other areas and solve all of them, because that's really the underlying problem is that chasm. We need to grow up. Oh, the analogy I used in my window talk is that humanity is like a 16 year old kid with a new driver's license and it is a boy, the testosterone is raging and he somehow gets his hands on this 500 horsepower Ferrari. He's either gonna grow up really fast or he's gonna kill himself. That's where we are as a species. We need to grow up really fast. And the good news is we are growing up. We're better now than we were 60 years ago when Alan Turing, the namesake for my, uh, the award that I won was hounded to death over his homosexuality enforcing the ethical standards of Great Britain of the 1950s and of most of the world, including the United States. Today, we look back in horror at that and say, how could our grandparents, our parents, in my case, have been so blind? How could I have been so blind? Uh, and it's much harder to see where we are, are making mistakes that our children and grandchildren might look back on and say, how could they have been so uncivilized? So in the talk, I, I proposed several. Um, how thinking of a child 100 years in the future, looking back, assuming humanity makes it, how could they have been so blind as to think they could put a nuclear doomsday machine in the hands of fallible human beings and survive It's just and, and make the mistakes they made? It's crazy. And then I ask, are the um, costs of, potential costs of climate change and the uncertainty is so large, I'm sorry, so small, the uncertainty so large that we shouldn't be taking action or the cost so expensive or the things we should be doing. And so that really is the fundamental problem as I see it. Right, thank you. So, uh, I mean, uh, as you mentioned, like uh, with the with the time, the, the difference comes in the minds and uh, as we think of it is the maturity that changes. <laughs> But uh, don't you think, uh, I mean, it can be, it can be not the maturity, but just a change in the uh, people's thoughts, or people's mind, that, that, that made us think so? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, after the Cuban, and by the way, I, I participated in a workshop about 10 years ago that said, uh, asked, we broke into small groups and they said, come up with a scenario whereby the public could suddenly become aware, uh, would become aware again as they were in the 80s of the nuclear threat and want to do, and do something about it. And the only one that most people came up with is a nuclear event where a nuclear weapon is actually used. I see another possibility, uh, something like the Cuban Missile Crisis where we come to the new, and, and by the way, I've also said, if I had a crystal ball and could tell you how we're going to make it, I wouldn't dare tell you because I can look at the past major changes in society and they, they seem, no one, if I predicted them before they happened, people would have said that will never happen. And so uh, I, we have to be careful here. But the one thing I would be short of a nuclear war that would wake people up is a nuclear crisis. And Ukraine may already have those, those dimensions to it. And I don't know whether society will wake up. I hope it wakes up before the crisis gets worse. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for this interesting talk. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great. Uh, we've got a question from Zahid, who doesn't have video, but he wants to ask the, a question. Zahid? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to ask you a question regarding, as a, as a student who's studying this subject, uh, cryptography, um, and perhaps moving on to looking at quantum methods down the line in terms of research, one of the issues that I have, and I, I may be speaking for quite a lot of people that are here, is, is uh, the, this hurdle of mathematics. You mentioned quite a few brilliant mathematicians, uh, even if we go back to Max Planck and Einstein and all these guys, all the way up to uh, you know, current um, cryptographic methods, all underlying principles are mathematically based. And, and when I look at it in, in terms of my future, and I think if I really want to get my teeth into this object, is to understand, really get into the mathematics of it, but it's, it's a really huge hurdle for me personally. Um, what advice would you give uh, to overcome that or perhaps 
maybe not overcome it, but to get I, it I, 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 first of all, my, my basic advice was be not to worry. Uh, when I did my PhD, I did it in uh, probability and statistics. My thesis was published in the Annals of Mathematical Statistics. I learned a little number theory uh, for uh, in, in, when I took information theory and coding theory, but not very much. And so when I started to work in cryptography and I needed to know more number theory, I bought, uh, I think it was Niven's book, which was the standard graduate text on uh, number theory. And I learned a little bit. So you learn what you need. The other thing, uh, so that's the answer to your question, not to worry. But the other thing, uh, I gather from your name that you may be South Asian uh, originally, but as you talked, you had not only a bit of a South Asian accent, but also a Scottish burr. And so, uh, because you're, you're, you're in Scotland. Uh, and this is again, I think the hope of the world that uh, we have people for, we are becoming a global society and national security is becoming inseparable from global security. It's not fully separated uh, I'm sorry, they're not fully intertwined, but we're, we're, we're getting closer and closer there. And so this uh, international cooperation that we have, where I look at the names uh, up there, uh, Stefan, I'm assuming is not Scottish, uh, uh, Pui, uh, Devi, uh, and you look at, at Stanford. Oh, by, so by the way, uh, so this is part of my hope is that we were seeing all this uh, uh, migration and going back and forth. The, um, when I, I mentioned before that um, when I started working in cryptography, all my colleagues told me I was crazy to do so. And I was, um, this, I won't go into the story. There's a story that relates to Tom Kylat's 80th birthday party. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a world famous uh, um, uh, control theory, information theory person. He's a colleague and friend of mine. Uh, when he came to MIT in the 1950s and got his PhD, he was the first Indian born PhD in electrical engineering. Can you imagine MIT without Indian students? And yet in just, what is it, uh, less than 70 years, we've gone from him being the first to it being almost, uh, uh, I wouldn't say the norm, but uh, certainly not, not a strange thing. Brilliant, thank you. Great, I've, I've got a question hear from someone uh, who the, the camera's not working just now. It's a rather long uh, question, so if you just bear with me. Uh, thank you for uh, speaking with us tonight, tonight and your continuous contribution to science. I live 45 miles away from a battlefield and I'm of course shocked and emotionally involved due to family ties with the involved parties. Uh, it said the, the question is what's your point of view from the ethical perspective of a person working during the day as a white hack and then to defend against threats and going back in the evening to switch to a black hat and fight uh, for what is perceived to be a just and honorable cause by most of the world's citizens? Well, we're in a transition period. I mean, it, it, it's big and is the world, uh, stuck in the world where national security comes at the expense of other nations, or are we in the new world where national security depends on the security of other nations, including that of our adversaries? We're in between. Uh, and so it's not surprising that, you, that you're in between. Um, I sometimes start off talks by saying that in 1967, when I had a summer job uh, between my master's and PhD, I was flying nuclear warheads in on the Soviet Union. Not in reality, but on a computer, we were doing uh, we were doing computer simulations for Merving of our um, um, uh, arsenal. At the time, it seemed to me like the only way to improve our national security. I had not yet been married long enough to my wife to see another possibility. Uh, I now see other possibilities, and I work on these. Now, the people who work on the other side are, are not bad people. And they're actually serving a very useful purpose. I told a former STRATCOM commander who's a colleague here at Stanford that while I disagree with him um, uh, on nuclear deterrence, he serves an important purpose. By defending the nuclear status quo, he provides an anchor that frees me up to explore where we might need to go without fear that we'll jump there discontinuously. But he's defending the status quo so I can explore over here. And if I'm right, hopefully over time, we'll eventually move there. And so you're in between two and it's up to you how much time you spend on the white hat versus the black hat side. Great, okay. And 
obviously it was quite worrying yesterday to hear that there, there had been a strike on a nuclear plant. And I think Ukraine has around 50% of its energy generated from nuclear power. What's your viewpoints on, on the risks that these power plants pose? Is it worth it to move towards what you could see as a, a green economy against the, the, the drawbacks that they might come, especially in, in, a, in a war? Well, um, this is a difficult question, although it turns out there's an easy answer that, I, that, I, that, I, that I'll provide. It's difficult because if you say I'm in favor of nuclear power, you lose half the audience. And if you're against nuclear power, you lose half the audience. Uh, what I now say is whether you're for or against nuclear power, everyone is against having irresponsible 16 year olds run a nuclear power plant, right? Well. Until we get past the quarter to quarter thinking on the part of the power companies, we have irresponsible 16 year olds running nuclear power plants. When Fukushima happened, the, the manager of the plant flooded the, the, the stricken reactor with seawater against the orders from Tokyo, from TEPCO. TEPCO was run by irresponsible 16 year olds. This man, very, in a very un-Japanese-like fashion, disobeyed orders and flooded it anyway. He knew that the plant was a lost cause. And so um, we really need to uh, think through uh, uh, the long-range consequences, the benefits, the trade-offs. And uh, too many of the people that now are in favor of nuclear power, because it's green, it's sometimes posed that way, uh, overlook the problems that we saw in the 60s, 70s, and 80s that are still there. We need to confront them and, and be honest with them, both the advantages and the disadvantages, and form our own opinions. The other thing I'll point out about nuclear power plants that relates to what Bill just said about the uh, um, attack, which fortunately does not seem to have spread radiation on the Ukrainian power plant. Uh, Frank von Hippel at Princeton, uh, professor of physics, uh, former president of the Federation of American Scientists in the 80s, uh, really brilliant and wonderful man. Uh, Frank was telling me about a year ago that um, you don't need nuclear weapons to have a nuclear deterrent, which was surprising. He said, every nuclear power plant is a Chernobyl waiting to happen uh, if it's hit by precision guided munitions and, and uh, sp spreads radiation. Now, I mentioned this to somebody recently who said that the containment vessels are designed to withstand a 707 impact. So we'd have to compare that to a, you know, a penetrating uh, uh, weapon. But um, if Taiwan, for example, is threatened by mainland China, uh, they don't necessarily need nuclear weapons to deter an, an attack on their nation that would um, uh, end it. All they, all they need is the ability to hit the, the various Chinese power plants uh, on the coast uh, near, near population centers to deter China from taking that action. So that's another problem with nuclear power plants is that are they sitting ducks in a war and do we, do we, do we have war under enough control that we don't have to worry about that? There's a final question, uh, really, is there anyone from your past that you think, you, you talked about some people weren't as recognized in the past and you see people like uh, uh, the the GCHQ inventors of public key encryption were never really recognized for many years. Is there any people that you remember from the past that, that really stick out as, as someone who made such a contribution but was never really recognized? Yeah, well, there's one other, I mean, there are a couple, come, uh, two actually come to mind. Richard Tropel, uh, who most people have never heard of, he doesn't like to publish, but uh, Don Knuth, I mean, he shared, unlike GCHQ, which kept things secret, Richard was sharing his papers. He just didn't like to write. He didn't like to write in a way that you could publish. And Don Knuth quotes him in one of his volumes because uh, uh, he shared papers with Don. He, uh, uh, Witt put me in touch with Rich, um, Richard Tropel uh, when we came up with um, uh, what's now called Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange. And uh, when the RSA report first came out, uh, Ron Reves sent me a preprint, you know, an advanced copy, and they were proposing 256-bit keys and he said, you should look at Tropel's work because he thinks he can factor F8, a 256-bit number using what a predecessor to the quadratic sieve and that Pomerantz credits as being the inspiration for the quadratic sieve. It was the Tropel sieve. So Rich is clearly a person in that category. Another one is Steve Polig, who unfortunately died about five or eight years ago. He was a student of mine. He died very early, about 60 years old. 
and the, what's now called the uh, Polak Hellman conventional crypto system is almost exactly the same as the RSA public key crypto system, except it's mod Q instead of mod N. We missed that. We walked all around and we even looked at mod N, but we didn't yet have public key cryptography. So we missed that you could make a public key system out of it. So Steve Pollard would be another. That's great. Well, th thank you so much. We've used up so much of your time and it's been a real uh, privilege uh, overall. So I, I can only thank you and I hope you enjoy the, the rest of your day and, and hopefully something good or for there to be peace in, in Ukraine sometime soon is, is something we probably all hope for. Uh, so thank you so much. I don't know if the students want to just unmute themselves just for one one five seconds or so, and just give a round of applause uh, for 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 play talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Bill. Wait, Bye, everybody. So, so, uh, sorry, Martin. Mm -hmm. Good to go ahead. Oh, sorry. Well, I was just saying that I really enjoyed this. It was a, it was a fun interaction. This is what makes life worthwhile. And so thank you for uh, doing it. And this format was really nice. Yeah, that's excellent. So hopefully we'll catch up quite soon. I'd love to have a longer chat with you. You have so many memories, so many important things. And I think your work has really changed the world uh, completely. And uh, hopefully it's it's really to a few more... Uh, a, a more secure, private, and re resilient world. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Amen. Thank you. Bye. Bye.